Listen, you video parrots. You take heed. This tape is being copyrighted. If I catch anybody making unauthorized copies, you will be persecuted. You will be subjected to numerous reruns of Jimmy Swaggart and Tammy Baker doing their crying act. Repeat offenders will have to watch George Bush and Dan Quayle on the campaign trail. Remember, you have been forewarned. <laughs> for the old spook show. You know, that's what spook shows mostly were, just a lot of ballyhoo. You know, back in the 30s, some enterprising magician got the idea to take his magic show, and at the end of the week on Saturday night at midnight, have a special spooky version with a seance and some spooky magic tricks. Now, these shows were highly successful from the very beginning. They used a lot of advertising, a lot of gimmicks, and they really went over well. So, in turn, lots of magicians were out doing spook shows. One of the ways they advertised the old spook show was a special preview trailer they showed on the screen for two or three weeks prior to the performance. Now, right now, let's just take a look and look at three or four of the old previews from the earlier spook show days.
Along with the preview trailers, they would do all kinds of signs and banners and 40 by 60s and one sheets in front of the theater, window cards all over town, special hand bills. They'd have a hearse parked in front of the theater. They'd have a coffin in the lobby. And they have a sign on the coffin. Here's an example. Quiet, please. Dr. Evil's asleep inside. Let's take a look at some of the posters. Some of the posters used on the spook shows. Philip Morris had some special lobby cards. Here's one. Three super shock shows on stage. First time here. King Kong, real, on stage. On stage, the mummy, in person. On stage, live snakes roam the theater. That's with the lobby cards. Okay. Here's a beautiful window card for Dr. Jekyll's Weird Show. Now, I happen to work on this show. We didn't actually promise them anything specific, just generalities. But the advertising on this show was very unique and very good, and we really packed them in. Here's one for Dr. Satan's Shrieks in the Night. Now, this show featured Marilyn Monroe mystically transformed. Elvis Presley, see the earthy materialization of Elvis Presley. Just a few magician's tricks was used to do this. Dr. Satan's Shrieks in the Night show was another very successful show from Joe Karsten. Here's Dr. Silkini, Jack Baker, the undisputed king of the spook shows, Jack Baker, Dr. Silkini. This is in the later days when he advertised Frankenstein, Dracula, and the Wolfman, and Gargantua, all on one show. This is the final tour of Dr. Silkini. Called it In Concert. This was in the late 70s. This was the final tour of the King of the Spook shows. Here's a beautiful one, Dr. Dracula's Living Nightmares. Beautiful poster. There was a cook from Brooklyn, and he had a show out called Horrors of the Orient, toured for about 10 years. Here's a beautiful poster from that show. Of course, we got Raymond, Raymond Corbin from Westminster, Maryland. He did the Zombie Jamboree show. And in later years, Raymond did Raymond's Voodoo show. He was a creepy looking character. And he had a buzzsaw illusion that would scare the shit out of you. In later years, Joe Karsten created a movie where the monsters came out of the movie, went into the audience, grabbed a girl, drug her back on stage into the picture, never to be seen alive again. This was called Monsters Crash the Pajama Party. A guy named Kara Coom had a show with a crawling thing from Planet 13. Lady Godiva floating in midair on a white horse. Then he decided to create a special show called The Cannibals of Caratiba. I happened to be on this show in opening day. We opened down here in Florida in an all-black house. The show went over fairly well, but it was way ahead of its time. The advertising was too strong, and it died a quick death in less than six months. In the 30s, the gentleman started doing the spook show. Now, in the 40s, Jack Baker got the bright idea to add monsters, and he added the Frankenstein monster to his Asylum of Horrors show. Now, this went on for a number of years. He was featuring Frankenstein, and Universal Pictures didn't even know about it. They caught up to him when he was playing a date in Los Angeles. Well, he finally worked out a legal deal with him, with the Universal Studios, 
and they presented the Frankenstein monster legally from then on. Let's take a look right now at a preview trailer advertising Dracula and Frankenstein. seem to be just promise them anything, promise them everything. Once they got to the theater, they'd have a good time, have a few laughs, and they would forget everything you didn't promise them. And it seemed to work. Magicians everywhere were taking out spook shows. They were making money hand over fist. It was really the going thing at the time. Now, a lot of magicians just did not have the personality or the know-how to handle a midnight crowd like they had when they did their little magic show in the church basement. Of course, they died a quick death, their shows flopped, and of course, they burn up lots of territory, and this made uh, theaters a little hesitant to book this type of show. But the strong ones survived and made a fortune. say the big three in the spook show business was Jack Baker, Dr. Silkini. At one time he had eight different units on the road. That meant they were playing 56 theaters a week. Joe Carston, of course, he created many campaigns. He was a promotional genius, a booking agent. Uh, he could just, he could do everything and he had many successful shows. And of course, Philip Morris was on the road for 27 years, and he played many theaters throughout this country. What I'm trying to do is give you a little idea of just what the old spook ghost horror shows were all about. Now, through the posters, the preview trailers, the advertising, and personal interviews with actual spook show operators, going to try to give you an idea just what the spook shows were all about. Just like the ad said, it's the spook show racket laid bare. Radio was a cheap and effective way to advertise a spook show. You could buy 30 spots for $30 and you could just blitz them with spots on the radio. When a teenager got out his little transistor radio, and turned it on and heard a spot for a spook show, he was hooked. He was sold. Right away, he was trying to raise the funds to buy an advance ticket. Let's listen to one of those spots now. Graveyard late at night and seen a coffin open. Have you ever thought what it would be like to see a person's head amputated? Think. Think of 
things so horrible that the human mind cannot imagine them. See all this and more when you see on stage, in person, that crazy makes up Dr. Evil and his tears of the unknown. Unlike anything that you've ever seen or heard of in the past. Hideous creatures from beyond the grave. Leave the stage and grab girls right out of their seats. Girls, do not come alone. Bring your boyfriend to protect you when the lights go out. You may find a live snake or rat under your seat. A real dead body is given away to some lucky person at every performance. Also, in person, the mummy and King Kong, famous Hollywood gorilla, real and alive. Plus, on the screen, two horrific motion pictures. Dr. Evil and his tears of the unknown. Plus, two horrific pictures. <laughs> to tell them they were chicken and they weren't brave enough to set through this super terrific horror show. If they were brave enough to set through the entire show, they were given a bonus, such as a two-for-one pass or a free pass to a future movie. They gave away eight by ten photos, gave away horoscopes, little slum ID bracelets, perfume. Every gimmick in the book was used and it worked and the spook show operators made a killing. Right now, let's talk to a few of the actual spook show operators that actually did the spook shows back in the good old days. First, we're going to talk to Harry Wise of Sanford, Florida. He toured with a number of shows for a number of years. I want to spend some time today and talk about the old spook show days. Some people call them the old ghost show days. Yep. Ghost right? and monster shows. Yeah. Monster shows, yeah. Start out being called a ghost show. Yep. Yeah, when's the first time you did a ghost show? Well, the first time I did a ghost show was 1956. And what I was that? I was very young. That was a, a show out of Houston, Texas, run by Wayne Harris. He met me down here in Florida and two weeks later wired me and I jumped on a bus here from Sanford, Florida and joined this show in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. I was only with that show a few weeks. I had personal problems. I had to leave that show and come back to Florida. Was that the voodoo show? No, no, no. That was that was a Dr. Jekyll title. Dr. That was Jekyll. Joe, Joe Carston's title. Uh huh. The man running that show was Wayne Harris out of Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. But now listen to I me. used to work for Wayne the I year was, before. I was on in 55. Yes, sir. I was only with Wayne that few weeks. Uh -huh. I came back here the Army got me in 1957, but by 1958, John L. Cates, Johnny Cates... I worked for Johnny. Johnny Cates took over the Jekyll Show, and Johnny Cates is the man that taught me the business. I was with him several months, all in 58. I came back home a little while, went back out with Johnny Cates in 1959, all over the United States and Canada with him. And Johnny taught me the business. John Cates was my mentor in the business. The That's Dr. It. Jekyll show didn't really feature anything except the spooks and ghosts. It didn't advertise any one monster in there. That's right. Yeah. Although we had, we did Frankenstein, we did the mummy, and we did the hunchback. Yes. And we also did a snake throw blackout. Mm -hmm. We did a snake throw. In other words, the Jekyll show, as Johnny and I did it, was a three blackout show. Uh -huh. Not just, a lot of those magicians took out a 50 or 55 minute magic act. And Jim, at the end of it, they had a little blackout with a monster and a couple of pieces of luminous cheesecloth. What? We, a we luminous cheesecloth? Well, that was the ectoplasmic manifestation. Yeah, the ghost in the, flying through the air was actually a piece of luminous cheesecloth. On a cane pole. On a fishing pole, okay. You got it. That's right. Yeah. Do you know well, I know that, but I want everybody else to know it. Yeah. Now, now the thing. And a couple of those Halloween skeletons painted with luminous paint. That was too. Five foot tall, yeah. That too, but, but now listen. When Johnny and I, I learned from Johnny Cates. Uh -huh. um, um, Johnny and I were gunny sacking buddies for years. Uh huh. And unfortunately, John just died uh, just short of two years ago. It was September before last, out there at the TAOM convention uh -huh. in Texas. Johnny and I were close. I'm serious. Johnny taught me everything: how to acknowledge the balcony. Yeah, remember how to, the balcony. How you used to throw the dummy out of the balcony when I was with him. How to everything, how to bow, how to make up, how timing. John Cates taught me the business, he really did. 
Okay, that was in 58 and 59 with Johnny. Then by 1960, I went on TV in Orlando as Mr. Magic. Yeah, I remember that. I had four wonderful years from 60 through 63 as Mr. Magic. Yes. Channel 6 in Orlando. By late 63, by November 63, I went out with my own ghost show again. Uh-huh. My ghost yeah, show this your time. Own ghost. I was then the mad doctor, Book the Dr. Jekyll tire. Yeah. Uh-huh. Philip Morris booked me my first few dates. Uh-huh. Then Joe Carston picked me up and took me all over 44 of the United States and Canada, all through late 63, 64, 65, 66. With the Dr. Jekyll still? Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Now, the way I did it was open with six minutes of magic, get the kids up from the audience for the committee. The, and I the did phony the, hypnotism and did, the, all did yeah. the hip bits, did yeah. the hot seat did a snake throw, Yeah. then we let the first monster come out and grab the girl and drag her off into the wing. That was a short blackout. Yeah. Uh -huh. Then she comes back out, we settle them down and all like that and do the zombie floating ball or the zombie floating skull thing. Then, by now, 45, 50 minutes is into the show, believe it or not. I'm not going into the whole pattern and everything, you yeah. don't need to. Then, on my blackout, I had three flash spots across that stage. I had 11 pieces of luminous ghosts and spooks. And the three flash pots helped blind the audience, plus it lit up your luminous. That's at right. The same time. Yeah, That's right. I remember that. That's yeah. right. Okay, now, now, I had the, the skeletons, the bats, the blinking eyes, I had the groping hand, and I had the only man to have the three foot high and rising Louisiana swamp spider. Yeah, I remember the swamp spider the that sw Philip Hart said. Okay, well he got it, he did it after I did it, trust me. Is that you right? You may trust me on that. So what, you may trust what me. was the next show you was on the title of the show? Uh, well, after 66. Yeah. Now, after being with Johnny in 58 and 59, uh -huh. then through late, late 63 to 66 with my own ghost show, uh -huh. then I got into booking and promoting with my first wife and I, got to booking and promoting auditorium shows for sponsors, uh -huh. the Big Full Evening Magic Show. Uh -huh. Then it goes to 1973, I went back out with a ghost show for Philip Morris. Uh -huh. and what was the title of that biggie? That one was Dr. Evil and the Terrors of the Unknown. What was he featuring on that? We featured a twist contest thing, giving away a dead body, which what? was the chicken. The frozen chicken. Frozen Win chicken. one dead body. Yeah. Win a dead they body. They did that back in the 30s in the yep, theaters. Yep, yeah. And he yep. revived that in the 60s and used yep, it again. Yep. Got some more mileage out of yep. it. Now, one of my best friends from the what 30s. What kind of monsters did you have in that show? We did, I did my same stuff. The Frankenstein and Hunchback and Mummy. Did whatever yep, you had. Yep, yep, it didn't yep, matter what the yep, campaign yep, said. Yep, yep, yep. Campaign didn't mean a thing, did it? Uh, campaign was to get them in there. Yeah. Then try to make them happy somehow. Make them laugh a little. Forget it. If it wasn't scary. Here's the thing. If you make them laugh, you do those three blackouts right, you make them laugh, and you have a good strong blackout, they usually leave the, the theater happy. Yeah. And then See, after I, did, I did one hour that amounted to a Hells of Poppin' type thing. Yeah. The old Olsen and Johnson thing. I love it. I, love I did it. an hour that was so close to Hells of Poppin', but, but like I say, you, you fill that hour. So many guys, I can't believe, I saw a couple of ghost shows, I'm not going to name names, but I saw a couple of ghost shows in those days. The guy would do 50 or 55 minutes of very poor magic. Terrible magic. And a three minute. Put you to sleep magic. One guy did 18 minutes with an Abbott's Dissecto wrist chopper. Yeah. No, 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 that's not a ghost show. No, 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 no. If you're going to do a ghost show, do a ghost show. I always thought the same way. Yeah. Now, after the Philip Morris show, what came up next? Then I got back into promoting and everything and uh, doing my full evening show in auditoriums and all. Uh-huh. Yep. Well, when did you get involved with the Monsters Crash the Pajama Party? Well, technically, I was working that on some dates while my wife and I was running promotions and doing our weekend dates for sponsors and all. Out of Louisville, Kentucky? And out of Louisville, Kentucky yeah. and Sanford and Orlando, Florida and all that. And, uh, uh... I did just about four or five months of dates with Monsters Crash the Pajama Party in the summer of 66. 66. I'm seg I segued out of the Dr. Jekyll show on the road with the live one-hour Ghost and Monster show. Yeah. Joe Carson and a guy named David L. Hewitt, I think it was David L. Hewitt. David L. Hewitt, came, yeah. Came up with this idea for this silly movie, and they call it Monsters Crash the Pajama Party, and I met the actor that starred in it, Vic McGee. Uh -huh. Short, very nice guy. The Mad though. Doctor. The Mad Doctor yeah. in Monsters Crash Pajama Party. Now, I did this in 66 for the summer of 66 
technically before I got back into the promotions and magic show and all now that. Now we're going to show that Monsters Crash Pajama Party later on on this video. But let's talk about it. Monsters Crash Pajama Party, just just tell me, it starts out as a movie. Go ahead and tell me about it. Well, it's uh, it's a movie. Uh -huh. uh, mostly non-entity actors. Vic McGee was was a nice guy. Uh huh. He broke me in on the unit. I knew him well and I liked him. Vic was a good kibitzer, funny man. I really liked the man. Uh huh. He loved to jackpot and have coffee and tell jokes. Just like great. you. And uh, you? <laughs> yes, yes. Now. Bullshit, some people would say. Or a town sucker would say bullshit. <laughs> well, a true southern gentleman might refer to it as equine excrement or something. But we, don't, we don't have to go into that. Now, Jim. Vic McGee taught me the unit. He stayed with me a week or ten days and taught me the unit. Here's the thing. that it opens. The movie opens with these kids going to a haunted house. Uh huh. And these kids, these are mostly girls and a couple goofy looking boys and they're going to have a pajama party. Mm -hmm. And it's said that the house is haunted. Mm -hmm. Well now the haunts are, the house is not really haunted, but down in the basement nobody knows this mad doctor's got this laboratory. Like Le Bella Lugosi and Spooks on the Loose, right? Something like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, let's, let's don't demean Bela Lugosi even that much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but anyhow, Vic McGee's a mad doctor. And he's got this beard and mustache, something like yours, and black horn rim glasses and a white coat on all the time. This is the key to the unit now. Vic McGee. In this, he's got a gorilla down here with him. What it is, they write in the plot and everything, Vic McGee says he's going to go out in the audience and grab a girl and bring her back up on stage. He's talking in the film. He's talking in the film. Mm -hmm. All is part of the plot, but he looks out and, and does it you know, mm -hmm. steps out of proscenium or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, that's an actor's term now. We're getting into the, the mm -hmm. legitimate theater now. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, yeah. See, you see the books you're surrounded by here. Uh -huh. I'm an aficionado of all that good stuff. Now, yeah. anyhow, anyhow, Jim, what it is, you have to have a girl in the audience that is a stooge that wears a white blouse and a checkered skirt. This girl has to be a stooge. She has to has wear this to match outfit, that, and you movie. have to talk to her before the show. Mm -hmm. You cannot go out there and grab any girl. Don't do that. Yeah. Now, her she big is brother a might beat hell out of you, but or go ahead. Her, or, or for whatever, is mm -hmm. loosely passed off as her boyfriend or whatever like that. Believe me, that I've seen a lot of boyfriends that were monsters. Enough of that. Now, the thing is, Jim, when the gorilla and mad doctor head for the out of the picture, right into the camera. Uh, Big G, every night, every theater, it's the same thing. You drink too much of this lang and tank juice and punch the whole job. Now, I'll get rid of that. Now, Big G, you take that ray gun and blast this thing right out of the theater. <laughs>
spook shows. One was called Monsters a Go-Go, and the other one's called The Horror Chamber of Blood and Gore. Here's Don. Everything else, that'd probably be one of my great pleasures in life. And I must say, after an introduction like that, I can hardly wait to see what I'm going to do next. Reminds me of the time the fellow introduced me and said, I want to introduce the most outstanding act in our show. Matter of fact, he's outstanding in the wings right now, waiting to come on. You know. I'm holding, Jim, I'm holding, as you know, I'm holding a, a window card. Oh, yeah, we use that on a lot of shows. A lot of shows. Well, I'll tell you a funny story about this. All right, the dead body, for those who don't know, was a chicken. And most of us had a little funny coffin in it, and put it in a little funny coffin, rather. And we'd get a girl up from the audience and have her put her hand in there and get some funny lines where we're like, oh, it's cold, it's hard and long, and different things like that, right? Well, I played a theater in Elkins, West Virginia, and a lady owned the theater. Her husband had passed away. And she owned the theater, and in my what was the, that body was a chicken, of course, the cheapest chicken you could get. And she had gone and bought an eighteen-dollar turkey, beautiful big turkey. And she said, "Here's your dead body." And I was ever dollar conscious. You said over my dead body. Yeah. I said, my goodness, goodness gracious, why would you do that, you know? And she said, well, these are all nice people. They come to the theater for all these years, you know? And she said, I want them to have something nice. And I'm counting dollars. She goes, uh, $18 turkey, and when we normally have a dollar turkey, uh, that meant there was $17 left, and I meant the half of that $17 come out of my pocket. You know, that was feeding the cast money, you know. And I said, well, the idea is a gag, ma'am. It's a joke, you know. It's just a little stunt that we use to help sell tickets and have a few laughs. And she said, well, that's okay. She said, I'll pay for it out of my own pocket. You don't have to pay for it. So, you know, I was one of the goofy stories with a happy ending, you know. But a lot of stuff like that happened over the years. Dom! Do you remember where we first met? Yeah, I do, Jim. With the United Artists Theater in Louisville. 1962. Jack Baker was there, remember? I, I think we got a window card. Yeah, I do. Show. I have one right over here. It says double-sided. That's one side, because he had lots of different papers. And uh, you see the holes in here with the... 
spring on it? Yes, sir. They were hanging these down from the marquee. That was still about, that was the end of the days of showmen and showmanship. And used to hang them and make them into triangles and hang them from the marquee and tape them to the sidewalk and put them in the stores and all that. Yeah, that is where we first met. That was the show where Jack Baker had Max Vickery, the singer, and he was doing the twist contest. There. The Rock and Shock Show. Yes. Now, there's something else I want to add here. You had just graduated from high school the day before, and you had already, under your belt, done a couple of spook shows. You've been out playing a couple of spook shows before you even graduated from high school. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's just for, let's just pretend right now that somebody's watching this video and they don't know what a spook show is. Could you just kind of give me a rundown and tell them what a spook or ghost show was and how it worked? Well, that'll take about a minute. The, the first concept of a spook show was spooky magic like invisible ghost writing on slates and uh, horn honking and different things that were kind of related to spiritualism and you know that ilk of thing that was the very beginning though. and then as it and they, was, and they did very big business but that was very early in the game and people were very superstitious very ignorant and the media was very limited to reach them so it was it was a big thing then it progressed and Jack Baker uh, ultimately became the king of spook shows because he made sort of a hell's a poppin' uh, thing out of it. And it was spooky at the end. And, and the way Jack did it, it was the most popular form, as anybody today that had ever seen one would remember, was fast, flashy opening with some magic, uh, producing bowls of goldfish out of the air, and that type of thing and all. Uh, then. A lot of gags on the stage with a group of people from the audience that we called a committee. Uh, hypnotism, uh, sitting on the chair and getting shocked and jumping up the hot seats, all that. A lot of comedy. And in the end, uh, the table of death or some similar type thing. And, and then the, the monsters would go towards the audience, black out, and then all the ghosts would fly over their head, which was usually glutinous rags tied on cane fishing poles. Uh, Hard Chamber and Blood and Gore, you know, we, we were kind of, uh, as Mark Walker says in his new book, uh, you know, The Ghostmaster, uh, Hard Chamber and Blood and Gore was a, a forerunner to a lot of the slasher movies that we have today. And we weren't really doing Blood and Gore on stage, we kind of lied about that, but uh, it was a great title. Matter of fact, it was your title, and uh, I brought it to life and made it uh, one of the old-time Biggie Spook shows. Everybody uh, piled in in record numbers to see it. And at the time, uh, when I was putting it together, you know, you and I talked, and you know, you had the title, and then I put all these ideas together. And we made the radio commercials for it in Columbus, Georgia. And of all weird things in the southern belt they had a german radio announcer working there and he made these commercials and they were fantastic he had no coaching or whatever he just did it with that voice and all of that german what i say discipline in them and all and it was beautiful and it just it worked good the ads were good and the stuff was good and uh, the show was good enough so we didn't get thrown out of town Earthial materialization of James Dean, and they featured uh, uh, Elvis Presley, Marilyn Monroe, and you were featuring on that tour Liz Taylor as Cleopatra. If you remember correct, I took a 24 sheet of Cleopatra and I cut that picture out of Liz Taylor and painted it with luminous paint, and we put it on a sheet of masonite on a stick where you could hold it up in the dark. Uh, I heard through the grapevine that 20th Century Fox was a little bit peeved about you using that. Yeah, Jim, they were kind of pissed off about it. Yeah. Uh, we, see, as long as you stayed in the sticks and played all the small towns, uh, if you were doing something like that, you never got any notoriety, you know. But as luck would have it, what we did with that interior materialization of Liz Taylor as Cleo, uh, we 
Pittsburgh. And as the picture of Cleopatra opened in Pittsburgh, it had a big quarter page ad. Our quarter page ad for our spook show was right next to it. And so those tear sheets went into the home office, and before I knew it long, I got a letter from their lawyers with a list of lawyers down the side along my arm. You know, I could say something else, but this is a family take. And they were going to take everything away from me, you know. So I sent them a Polaroid snapshot of my old Pontiac, and I told them they could have my Pontiac, my two king poles, come get it. And it never did. And I see I a little went, humor in there. And yeah, and I went back into the sticks again and just kept playing this. You were game. speaking of Pittsburgh. That's when we played the six drive-ins, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. We played six drive-ins Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And when you were setting up the deal, with, and they had all the managers in the home office to tell them about it, and one of them dumb managers, he said, uh, how's this go-go girl going to be at two drive-ins at the same time? Now, go ahead and tell me what the, what Mr. Stern told him. <laughs> well, Mr. Stern, George was a great guy. He loved any showman with guts and pizzazz. And, you know, he loved Kroger Bath and on and on, you know. And he, and he hated the establishment. He hated the guys from Paramount and Fox and all, but he had to do business with him, you know. Uh, he was a great guy. So this dummy's asking there, he's having a meet uh, with them, and we're trying to tell them ways to exploit it and how best to do it, you know. And so this one guy says, well, how is this go-go girl going to be in two places at the same time? And Stern is looking at him, and he says, your ass, he's got two girls. Next question, let's get it. Those combined. Super shocker number one, Dr. Macabre's Frightmare of Movie Monsters. Imagine seeing almost all the screen's scariest monsters alive, in person. Hunchback of Notre Dame, Teenage Frankenstein, Daughter of Dracula, The Fly, a man's body, a fly's head. Rodan, the flying monster, the colossal beast, and more, many more, never here before. Plus, super shocker number two, Spooks a poppin', a thrilling new idea in spook shows. We double dare you to see this double header of super monstrous, superhuman, super shockers in person on the stage. New kind of horror show, Dr. Satan and his Shriek in, in the night. night. If you think you've seen horror shows before, we warn you, this new kind of show is completely unlike anything you have ever seen. The action takes place in the audience. You'll be surrounded by the most hideous horde of horror creatures ever to walk on the earth. You'll see back from their graves, fiendish vampires who drink human blood, living corpses, werewolves, ghost women, 1,001 nightmarish creatures. Girls, do you have the nerve to meet the Invisible Man? He puts his arms around you. You can't see him, but you feel his presence. What a new thrill. Dr. Satan hypnotizes everyone in the audience, including you. You'll see the slave maidens at the mercy of hideous beasts. Human sacrifices, death on the slab. So scary, your blood will run cold. Dr. Satan has appeared in person with and startled George Goble, Donald O'Connor, Orson Welles, Jack Bailey, Art Baker, and many others. Ed Johnson of the New York News wrote, At long last, I have seen a horror show even scarier than advertised. A horror show strictly in a class by itself. If it thrills you want, thrills you'll get when you see Dr. Satan's Shriek in, in the night. night. It's brand new. It's brand new. Positively has never been shown at this theater before. Don't miss Dr. Satan's Shriek in, in the night. night.
Phil Chandler, a noted illusionist and circus ringmaster, appeared with many spook shows to include Jack Baker shows, Dr. Franklin and his spooks on the loose, and others. Here's Phil. Up Phil Chandler, noted illusionist. Phil's been around since heck was a pup. He was back there in the, in the spook show days. Uh, oh, he goes way back. In fact, Phil, when did you when did you first start out in the spook shows? In the spook show business, it was oh probably early early '60s. Uh, my partner at that time, Steve Connors, who I owe an awful lot to. Uh, got me started in the thing. But prior to that, uh, I used to be an assistant but the, on the Dr. Franklin show, who had, I would say, probably probably one of the best uh, ghost shows that ever toured. We not only played theaters, but we played drive-in uh, drive theaters also. He had his own portable stage that actually was all set up. I mean, it was better equipped and better facilitated than any theater you could ever get into. And I toured with him on and off uh, while I was in high school and then when I got out of high school. And uh, that's basically where I got the experience, so I thought. And then our local RKO house one time wanted to do a Halloween spectacular thing and wanted me to do a spook show. And I said, oh, hell, I can do that. I was well, Frank sure I'd do that. And I think I got the amazing total of $100 for the show, which $100 back in those days was pretty good. It died, and I swore up and down I would never, ever do another spook show in my entire life. I mean, we couldn't get a total blackout. It was just disastrous, and we're trying to do actual makeup for Frankenstein and, and wrap the mummy up, and disaster city. So after the show was over, I should say after that abortion was over, <laughs> back in the dressing room, I said, I swear to God, I'll never, ever do another ghost show in my life. A couple years later, my partner, S.J. Connors, got me fired at the job that I was working at. I was working at a stock brokerage firm and doing little club dates and occasionally helping Frank when he'd be in the area I could make it. And, of course, I was all upset. He got me fired. He called in and said that I quit and all like that. He said, well, don't worry about it. He says, next week we're opening with a Jack Baker unit of Dr. Silkini and his Asylum of Horrors. I said, Connors, I said, you know, I can't, I won't do a spook show. Oh, yes, you can. We're going to do it. And so we got busy and made some ghosts, and I bought gallons and gallons of luminous and paint, cheese cloth, and we're making skeletons and all that stuff. And I'm making out cue cards on the back of old window cards. I mean, what the sequence was, what the jokes were, and I had, I used to have that foot shelf all lined with, with, you know, what came next and, and on top of that, Connor says, don't worry about it. He says, I'll be off in the wings to keep you moving. And Joyce, that was his wife at that time, she'd be behind the curtain telling me what to do in this that, and the other. So I'll never forget, we opened for Stanley Warner in the Pittsburgh area. We were doing uh, a multiple break there. Jack was playing a downtown house. I think I played in the Keith Courthouse. And Bob Woodlock played another, and, and uh, uh, Bobby Williams, Margie's brother, was doing another, and Wally Selman was in another house doing something. And man, there I go pulling in. I had all I had was props and no talent in that respect. And guts, right? Guts, guts. Plus, we were getting paid pretty good money. So our our spook show format ran just a little bit different than Jack did, uh, in the respect that Jack. When he would do the show, as soon as the movie was over with, he'd bring up all the lights in the house and start his backstage announcement. But we didn't. We just brought up like the color foots and we played an overture. And uh, of course, like I said, we started out the show. You know, I would appear in the flash of smoke. We were carrying the flash appearance, Temple of Benares, burned alive, and then closed out the show with the trunk trick and smaller magic in between. And, oh man, I was, and at that time we were doing like four shows a day, one, four, seven, and nine. And as my cohort, Roy Houston, used to say, you do shows at one, four, seven, nine, thirty-two, seventy-six, hike, 
10 of business was any good to get to a midnight ramble. <laughs> so after that first show was over, man, I'm reading those cue cards as we're going along doing the gag, doing the show. We got through it somehow, thanks to Connors and Joyce. And uh, <clears throat> so the second show, then it just so happened Denny Moore, not the beef stew man, who was district manager for Stanley Warner, happened to be backstage for the third show. And he was all excited because we didn't do the Baker format, like I said, the turn up the house lights immediately. We played an overture in the backstage announcement was start and all like that. And so Connor's got him quiet and he said, we do it totally different. We do it totally different. And I noticed he, uh, Denny Moore, and his partner that he brought with him, they were looking around, they're seeing all these crates and props and stuff like that. Well, by the third show, which he witnessed, this was starting to shape up pretty decent. I was still relying on the cue cards and the foot trough. In fact, before the show would start, I'd be down in the orchestra pit making sure that the cue cards were all set. So then we were going to have a late lunch with Jack. We were to meet Jack downtown. Actually, it was dinner, I'm sorry. And uh, so Jack and Margie and myself and Connors and his wife and uh, Denny Moore and his associate was there and we're sitting there and we're having dinner and he says, Jack, he says, tomorrow, he says, I'm going to put these kids in the A house. But Jack always played the A house, the downtown A number one house. Jack says, why? He says, well, truthfully, he says, these kids have a different slant on it. And besides that, they got props. But Jack always went in with a zombie ball, a half a dollar, a pack of playing cards and a rubber mask and a few luminescence, and that was it. All in an attaché case. Yes, yes. And a few silk handkerchiefs and a shirt card board, you know, for his opening silk production. Frankenstein, or you do Dracula, or you do Gargantua the Gorilla. Right. Well, I used to ask Connors when i get up in the morning, because they had uh, Dr. Silkini headed up one, Dr. Sin headed up one, you know, so the uh, average night. So I'd ask Connors, who am I today? Yeah. You know, and I'd walk in, have to see what campaign we were doing. And that's who I was for that day. But most of the time, I never used the Dr. Sin name. The name Silkini, I always liked it. It had a nice flow to it. And, uh, as far as Joe Carson, yes, I did work for Joe Carson. And that's when we were bucking for a raise from Baker, which was like trying to pull hen's teeth. And uh, made a deal with Carson. Very, very fair. Liked working with Joe. We did the Dr. Jekyll and his weird show thing. Had fun with it. And... Uh, we're right in the middle of a tour, and I get a long-distance call from Toledo, Ohio. Well, I knew who the hell it was. And Jack said, what are you doing there? I said, well, I'm working. He said, well, why are you with Karsten now? I, I thought you worked with me exclusively. I said, Jack, we've been asking you for a year for an increase, you know, in money. You won't do it. Karsten has come up with that money. Jack says, well, Jesus Christ, all he had to do was ask me. And I, he I, scared the hell out of him, and you dared him to come, and you said, are you a man or a mouse? Can right. you take it? Yeah. And they all come out there, I'm tough, and I'll show this guy I'm the toughest guy you ever seen. That's right. And like I said, I learned from Jack. I can only recall one house where I ever had problems in, and that was in uh, Connecticut, uh, Connecticut uh, the, uh, New London, Connecticut. Uh, we only had one show at 9 o'clock, so we were in the theater like 3 o'clock, setting up sound system, stuff like that. And ring-a-ding the clown. You know Dwight Damon? Yeah. All right, Dwight, and guess who came down at that time to visit? Was your friend Kreskin, the amazing SS Kreskin, uh -huh. except he was not Kreskin. Uh -huh. He was going to take a hypnotic show up to Canada, or had one up in Canada, and then was going to play the state from the play theaters with us. And he was asking his advice on thing. But first of all, I don't think the United States would go for a hypnotic show. So, uh, we got the show set up, and uh, we all went out to dinner. Well, we come back, and the place is jammed, packed with sailors. The fleet was in. And the first movie was in, because we always did two movies, three stooge cartoons, and then stage show. First movie was in. And it, it's packed. Now, I mean, I can hear them clear out on the street. They're hooting and hollering and carrying on. So we went in, got dressed, all like that. And 
the rule of thumb was, after the movie was over with and he started your backstage announcement, if you didn't have them quieted down during the backstage announcement, there was no sense going out on the stage. So I got him down to a low roar, at least. Because we had to start the thing. Okay, so I go out and do my whirlwind opening and all like that. And I look out over the footlights, and Christ, there's fights in the aisle. Oh, yeah. I look up in a loge, and there's two sailors have some brought up there with their legs spread apart. And I mean, they're giving her what for. Somebody's beating another person over the head with a whiskey bottle while this guy's spilling on with a, a seat handle. From, or an arm handle of the theater chair. I mean, it's just total mayhem. Well, I'm out there going, oh, I'm going to... Don't know, slow down. Keep yeah, going. Yeah, keep going. You know, can't uh, hit a moving target. <coughs> and I look off stage right and I see the theater manager going like... I go, oh, shit, this is... He ain't going to want to pay off, you know, a thousand things, you know. So I finished open like that and I walked over to the side to pick up the mic. He said, get off the stage! So being so obedient, sir, with the hammer come off the stage. And I walked up and said, what's the matter? He says, fuck them. They don't want to see a show. We got their money. Push the button. <laughs> the lights came down the second movie. Come on. He says, how long did it take you to get this stuff packed up? I said, about 15 minutes. He says, come on up. We'll settle. He says, it's a nice bar across the street. Take you all out. I love it. Late dinner. I <laughs> love it. You won't but, buy many of them, would you? That's for Out of the depths of darkness rises... Garganta, the true king of monsters. He's on his way alive, in person, to scare the yell out of you. Garganta, on the stage, in Dr. Siltini's giant triple scream show, for the first time on any stage. The stage show that brought you the Frankenstein monster in person now brings you direct from Hollywood, Garganta, the giant gorilla of the universe, alive and in person, in a three-hour performance filled with more chills, thrills, laughs than you ever experienced in this century. It is engrossing, exciting, fascinating, filled with tense climaxes, gripping scenes, beautiful starlets. Yes, it's Garganta, this wild, inhuman menace, this 782 pounds of dynamite that makes Kong the gorilla look like a monkey. And that's not all. During the dark sea ends when all the lights are dim, ghosts, spirits, and vampires descend into the audience. You may find yourself holding a ghost, your girl, or someone else's girl. So watch out when the lights go out. But as Mae West would say, it'll separate the men from the boys. In New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, critics have proclaimed this stage attraction to be the show you must not miss. Even though it's a stage presentation to send you home in frantic flight, there are also some very eye-appealing scenes created by these beautiful Hollywood starlets in gorgeous costumes designed by Adrian. Yes, it's a stage show for everyone. But those of you under 16, please be accompanied by an adult. Not only because of what takes place during the performance in the Dark Sea Ants, but the adult may be afraid to walk home alone. Now is your first and only chance to see, in person, on stage, and alive, Garganta, the giant gorilla of the universe. Watch for it. Remember the time the place and the date to see Garganta alive and in person. Houston, Houston of Gibtown, Florida, toured with a number of spook shows. He had the pleasure of working with Bill Neff on his Madhouse of Mystery. He even had his own show called Houston's Hunicinations. I see you got Bill Neff up there from the old spook show days. Did you know Bill Neff? Did I know Bill Neff? He was one of my closest friends, yeah. We were very close. Matter of fact, uh, we uh, produced shows together one time. We worked at the Theater together. We worked uh, 
And the most famous theater of them all, I guess, the Apollo Theater, right? Yeah. In New York City. Street. Yes. 125th Street in Harlem in New York City. I combined my show with Bill Nance for a full week stand. We hung 20 sets of lines. We had 12 girls in the line. We had, oh my God, what a big show that was. And he introduced me as his successor at that time, you know. Yeah, you remember right. you telling me that story about the battery in the truck? Battery in the what? Hey, you know how they steal a battery out of the truck or something to keep somebody from stealing the truck in New York City? Oh, yeah, you always took Tell me the story out. about how you got it somewhere and he wondered how I got there. Yeah, we always took the batteries out of the truck to keep people from stealing them, sure, you know. But, but, but then you had to be more clever than about a lot of different things. He taught me how to steal. First thing you did was steal a garbage can. That was the first thing you'd steal. Say. And I said, why do you steal a garbage can? He'd say, that way, when you want to park, you put the garbage can over the fire plug, see, on the corner. You know, oh, you know, he cut the bottom out. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, because the cop would write you a ticket if you park in front of the fire plug. Bill Neff taught you, know, you this. Yeah, Bill Neff taught me things. Yeah. Like, oh, he taught me all his clever things, man, how to park in New York City. You had to know all that shit to park in New York City. Yeah, well, I can understand. I mean, it was a difficult town to park in, believe me. <laughs> well, uh, you also worked with Jack Baker, didn't you? No, oh, God, about... Uh, I guess about seven years all together. Seven years all together with Jack Baker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, what, what was your first year, you think? Do you remember? Well, uh, I first met him, well, that was way back in the 50s, my God. Let's see, 50. Well, I first met Bill Neff in 55, and that's when he was still doing the Madhouse of Mystery show. And then I met Baker just shortly after that. It must have been about 56 or 7, I guess. Right along, it was the middle 50s. And, and, and then... Uh, but I didn't really start to work for him until late 50s, 58 or 59, I guess it was. You know, Mark Walker's got a new book out called The Ghost Masters. Yeah, I heard about it. And uh, I've seen it. I'm going to order a copy. It's got a lot of stuff in it, but it don't have these good old stories like you just told about Neff and all. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a Baker story? <laughs> so many Baker I can tell you about 10,000 Baker stories. Let me tell you Baker stories. Uh, okay, uh, quick, a quick one just to give you the insight the way his mind worked. Um, every time when we would do the show, every time we would ask him a question, he always had the same answer. He would say, under the green light, it'll make no difference, you know. Under the green light, it'll yeah. make no difference. Yeah, 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 that was his answer yeah. to every question. I can remember that. We'd say, well, Jack, that monster looks like shit. That monster ain't going to fool anybody. That's the worst looking monster I ever saw. He says, under the green light, nobody will ever know the difference. I already had a $3 a gorilla mask and an old fur coat on one on one day. Oh, God. I'll tell you the greatest story I can think of. I mean, there's 10,000 <laughs> acre stories, but on but, oh, the top of my head was at the Uptown Theater, the old Waterville House in Philadelphia, man. We were playing there, and... Jack was got so sloppy by that time he had forgotten about what kind of monsters were. As a matter of fact, he got so sloppy he was sending us out front to look at the marquee of the theater to see what monster we were featuring. Yeah. He couldn't remember what monster we had. Well, he had three different units. And this would be ten minutes before the show started. Uh -huh. We'd run backstage and we'd tell him what monster was. Then Jack would say, oh, well, we got ten minutes to create a monster in. And then he would. He'd create a monster in ten minutes. So it's one white shoe polish for Dracula, yeah. right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Shinola. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. The Griffin, Griffin, all white shoe polish. Yeah. And the face and the, uh -huh. Yeah, oh yeah. And, but it's one particular thing. The day I'm talking about, I come backstage. And <laughs> it's unbelievable. I come backstage. I said, Oh my God, Jack. It's Gargana, the giant gorilla. Right? Uh, That's what it says in a marquee. Yeah, 675. Now, now, keep in mind, it's five minutes of showtime. So he's got to figure out how to build Gargana, the giant gorilla, in five minutes. So he says, well, he turned to Margie standing there, right? His, his lovely, devoted wife. <laughs> he says, Margie, he says, give me the fur coat. <laughs> and she always had this beautiful $5,000 mink coat that she had wrapped around. She always, even if it was 90 degrees, she had this fur coat wrapped around. And, and, and she says, no, God damn it, Jack. She says, you aren't getting a fur coat again. Well, see, the word, the word that worried me, the key word there was again. That meant that this had happened before. Right? I went, oh, no, again. You know? And so so he does. He, and she, so they're fighting. They're pulling the mink coat back and forth. And finally, he wins. He drags the mink coat off her. And he wraps it around this guy. Meanwhile, we had a guy on the show named Steve Connors, who I'm sure you yeah. remember well. Yeah. And he says, well, it, now we get the fur coat draped around. He says, well, we need something for the head. 
So Steve looks around backstage and there's a moose head up on the wall, man, it was left over from a moose convention, right? Uh -huh. So he takes the moose head down and, and he goes, bam, bam, and he breaks the antlers because the thing had antlers, right? So, yeah. So he breaks the antlers off the moose head and he sticks it on the guy's head. And he says, there you are. He says, there's Gargana, the giant gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> we were going to scroll with Margie's fur coat, two little snows that got on top of his head. And he goes out. <laughs> and Jack says, You want to see Gargana the Grill? There's 3,000 jigs sitting out here in the audience, right? And, he, and then he comes out and he walks and he goes, and one of the jigs jumped up with a ball bat and they went whack over the head, he right in. And knocked him silly, man. I down love him. it. But, yeah, but that was his idea of a monster, yeah. Tell me about your show, Houston. Houston. How you say it? Houston's hallucinations. Hallucinations, yeah, yeah, that's what Hard I'm doing now. Yeah, yeah. Tell All me right. about that show. Well, that was probably part of the reason, uh, you just said part of the reason why it wasn't a big success, because nobody could pronounce it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you did play dates with it. It was a spook show, really, right? Yeah, basically it was, well, no, 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 it wasn't. You see, I was also a Bill Neff fan. I worked with Jack Baker all those years, but I, but I loved Bill Neff. Bill Neff was your favorite. Bill Neff was my favorite yeah. because he did a legitimate show. Jack Baker did an illegitimate show, yeah. believe me. Bill Neff <laughs> gave him a good show and they left there feeling good, didn't they? Yes, he did. Yes, yes he I believe really that, did. yeah. He had a hell of a show. And when, when he left Jack Baker's show, they yeah. wanted to kill somebody. Well, but well, they didn't start out that way in the beginning. I never, you know, you know, they both hated each other. They hated each other with a passion. Bill Neff used to call, he used to call him Jack Faker in the puke show. That's what he called him. You know, I mean, that'll give you a small idea how he felt about Jack Faker. Now, but but the point is, man, that that they were both great for their own reasons, man. You know. Baker was a great showman. He really and he's was. a great businessman. And, had to put and them a circuit great businessman. And he had did. eight units touring at one time. That's right. That's true. Money coming in like crazy. When I started with him, he had seven units. Now think about that. Seven units playing one town every night. Seven times seven. Forty-nine. We were playing forty-nine towns a week. Think about that. Nobody in history's ever done that. Now in the forties, right? he was yeah. in the forties. He's grossing like. $2,900 on a Wednesday night in the 40s, yeah. and that's like $10,000 now. That's $10,000 a night with a spook show. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. When he first started out, he had a beautiful show and all, and then he kind of went to hell in a handbasket towards the later years. Neff had a beautiful, beautiful show. What Neff was, he had a beautiful illusion show, which is what it was. With spooky things added on. Yeah, you know, uh huh. You know, he would do the spare cabinet, he would do neat stuff. And it, but Neff had clever and stuff. And everything too. went well, though. Yeah. Everything was done well. And it was done very well, yeah. Yeah, compared to, there's no comparison. I, I can see why they hated each other, because they were at opposite ends of the scale. I mean, Neff wanted to go for quality, and, and Baker didn't give a shit. Wanted he wanted to go for the bank. Go for the goddamn for the dollar. Yeah. Yeah. The dollar, yeah. yeah. That's all he cared about. So in the end, I guess, how can you say who's the winner? Well, you mentioned, yeah, uh, you mentioned you mentioned Steve Connors. Yeah. Did you know Dr. Franklin? Oh, very well. Oh, the Leon Franklin. I'm real. just a kid, and I hitchhiked to Chattanooga, Tennessee, to see Spooks mm -hmm. on the Loose, sir. And I'm out in front of this theater in a black part of town. That was a good waiting, title. Yeah. Waiting on the midnight show, and one guy kills <laughs> the other guy, murders him <laughs> right there, standing in line, waiting to get in the damn Spook show. And the hearse comes up and they haul the body away. And I said, well, it's going to be hard for Franklin to talk this, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, that's about how rough the grounds were. That's, that's, that's not unusual. Franklin built a big old portable stage and played a lot of drive-ins, too, didn't he? Yes, he did. An Beautiful. elaborate Beautiful. Portable. He was the only one to ever do it right. At the drive-in. Yeah. Yes. yeah. That's He's what the I only heard. one that yeah. ever did The only one. He had a, a 40-foot trailer, flatbed trailer, pulled behind about a three-ton truck. He pulled it behind the, in front of the screen tower, and he would erect all the scenery. That it was beautiful. They had traveler curtains. They had it was really done he well. He could do it right. Yeah, did it right. The yeah, he was the right. only one. A lot of guys uh, played driving, but he was the only one that did it right. The only one. Believe what's me. the biggest crowd you ever seen at a spook show? Biggest crowd? Yeah. What's the year? Oh God, that would have to be. Uh, well, I mean. Historically speaking, I would say Dallas, Texas, in 1940. Let's see, Bed Bergeron can tell you better because he was there. It was 47, 48, when Baker actually packed four theaters in one night. Packed 
four theaters one night. I believe it. I've heard all them stories about yeah. bicycling the show. Yeah, he bicycled the show. And the uh -huh. last show went on like at four or five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Name me last some, one. And, you know. Name me some other people you work with on the spook shows. Did you ever work for Carson on any of his units? Uh, Joe Carson begged me for years to work for him, but since he was the number one enemy of Jack Baker, I wasn't allowed to work for him. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. And, Cause uh, Baker had you in his pocket. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, well, after all, I was, I, I, I did live at that time east of the Mississippi, and and and, and you know what I mean. So yeah. see, see, Baker and Carson had split the whole country east. But they had cheap so, jumped so, the line. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, right. Baker had everything east of Mississippi, Carson had everything west of the Mississippi, and and, and so. Yeah, but 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 they would cheat though. They would cheat like a son of a bitch. They jump over the line whenever they felt like it, man. Uh huh. Yeah. But but so no, I never worked for Carson. No, I didn't. But he had some really great illusionists, by the way. People like John Daniels. Yeah. Kirk Kirkham. Kirk Kirkham. Yeah. Yeah. And our number one enemy against Baker was Johnny Case. He was our number one. Remember Johnny Johnny Case looked like a looked like a spook show He had that yeah. goatee. Looked like yeah. the devil himself. Yeah, he was the number one enemy. Let me tell you a Johnny Case story. I'm working as an assistant, and we're playing down around Houston. You know, Johnny was a big boy with a big butt. And his mother come over to visit, brought him a brand new tuxedo, must have cost $350, black tails. He went in and did the sub truck, busted the butt out of his brand new tux the first time he ever wore him. He was mad or the hell, you know. Well, John, Johnny was one of our enemies. You know. Do you ever know Wayne Harris? Uh, Wayne Harris, all those guys. I worked with Wayne, I worked all with All those Johnny. guys were Carson were our enemies. You I understand. worked with Pat Patterson on a Karakum unit one time. Too. Oh, Karakum. He's That's the, another story. He's another story, yeah. He burned a few, <laughs> burned a few bridges, too. Oh, yeah. my God, yeah, Karakum. The mighty Karakum. But Karakum had the most beautiful advertising. He had like 14 different three sheets of day glow. Oh, he had the a worst. A 24 sheet and no show. No, the worst shit I ever saw in my life, man. It was like, it was like, oh God, it was so awful. Like Doing the spirit slate like anybody give the day. It was the know. worst thing I ever saw. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example how bad he was. Uh, I can remember a phone call one time. I listened in on Jack Baker. He, he called Jack Baker one time. I was listening in on, on the third phone, right? You know, and, <laughs> and he says, I not understand, Jack. They keep closing me up. I not understand. Why do they close me up? And Jack says, well, you're doing the reincarnation of Adolf Eichmann, for Christ's sake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Carl <laughs> Chance from back in the grave. Yeah. I says, remember him. And he says, 99% of all theaters are owned by Jews. Now, he says, what the hell do you think they're going to do to you? They're going to close you up, right? <laughs> what else are they going to do? Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, have you got any other cute stories before we close out about the spook show days? Oh, God. When was the last go-around for you? <laughs> uh, uh, it's funny. It's, it was a transitional period, man. Jack had set me way out to the farthest point there could be on planet Earth, which was Missoula, Montana. Yeah, the end of the, the world. end of the world. You can't get any <laughs> farther away than Missoula, Montana. And that's how I felt. I was playing the Wilma Theater in Missoula, Montana. <laughs> this is a true story. Missoula, like, man, you know where that is. That's like the end of the world, right? And, but we're packing and jamming them. We're knocking them down. I mean, the crowds are lined up for blocks, man. You know, I couldn't believe it. In the snow. You know, oh, yeah. yeah. So, so we're packing and jamming, and, and, but I, I, I somehow I knew, I'd already seen the handwriting on the wall, man. I knew the end was coming fast, you know. And then besides, I wanted nothing more to do with it. And that one afternoon before the show, I went out to a building here in town. There's a circus playing, they said. So I walked in there, and there's a guy shoveling elephant shit into the building. You know? And I started talking to him, and he says, well, who are you? And I said, well, I'm Dr. Houston doing a spook show down here at the Wilma Theater. He says, you mean you're the guy with all those crowds of people lined up or blocked down? I said, yeah. And he says, well, you ever think about doing illusions in the circus? I said, well, no, I hadn't really thought about that. I said, but yeah, I said, I'll bet I could figure out how to do it. He says, good. And he shook my hand. He says, you're booked in St. Joe, Missouri next week. And I said, well, who the hell are you? And he says, my name's Hubert Castle. Was and that he, Hubert Castle? That was Hubert Castle. And that's how I left the spook show business and got into circus business. And that's the God's truth. I now, it. I want to change the subject. Yeah, uh, you remember Jack Baker's little magic land of Mother Goose? Very well. I was a star of it. What do you mean? You was a star, and that was, was a cute, my show. Yeah. That was a cute little show on stage. Yeah. But when they converted it to film, it kind of went to hell. I recently read a oh. review on that, 
And you know what they said about it? Two-word review. Beyond pathetic. Well, it was pretty bad. But wait a minute. Now, let me, can I say something on our defense? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm allowed to do that. Okay. Now, I have seen famous, very famous Broadway shows, like, for instance, uh, Little Abner is yeah. one example where they actually went in and shot the Broadway musical on the stage yeah. as a movie. And it was Pop terrible. Banana, they did and that. it was terrible. It was terrible. And yeah. there, there were several examples yeah. of New Faces was terrible. It was a bunch exactly, of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it was always terrible because you could not shoot a stage show and make a movie out of it. You can't do well, that. Well, they used to shoot them terrible. over our last shows with one static camera yeah. out there. And boy, that put you to sleep too. In other words, the stage show is a stage show, a movie is a movie. When you try to blend the two together, it doesn't work. You either have to make a movie out of it or it has to be a stage show. Because what works on the stage doesn't work in a movie. It's very simple. That's why the magic land of Mother Goose was beyond pathetic. <laughs> of mystery have appeared. Now, coming on this stage in person is the most amazing mystery man of all time, Houston and the original Houston's Hallucinations. Starring the girls with hex appeal, Joyce Harris, Kathy Bard, Sherry Winters, Cindy Curtis. Girls, girls, and more girls dressed in the most daring designs Paris has to offer. And if you want mystery, witness the unbelievable flight to outer space. See a girl without a middle, and the weird and unusual burning of a she-devil. See all this and more in Houston's Hallucinations, coming on this stage soon. Extra, extra, the first time on any American stage, see the talked-about girl in the topless swimsuit. It's sexational. Raymond Corbin of Westminster, Maryland, better known as Raymond, toured with a number of spook shows in the 40s and 50s. He had the Midnight Zombies Jamboree, and his most famous show was the Mad Doctor's Voodoo Show. We recently visited him in Westminster and filmed this interview. Pretty girl in here, I'd, I'd barely be chopping her head off. Yeah, or an ugly one either. <laughs> she don't have to be pretty. This is a dope show. Huh? This her face dope show anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh -huh. Had a pretty girl. I got the wrong goddamn soil on my plate. You want the gimme, girl? <coughs> Who made that chopper? That's an old fair. That's what I thought. An old fair. Old fair chopper. You know, we're talking to Raymond Corbin here, Westminster, Maryland. Raymond the Magician. Been doing magic for how many years? 60 years? 68 now. 68 years. And he's got magic kits and stuff upstairs. He's had for 68 years to prove it. Got lots of documentation of his background upstairs. The man's did everything. He's did it all. Big illusion shows. Spook shows. He says he's got scars to prove it on the spook shows. This was the uh, big fun stage show, strangest show on earth. And the big thing, let's not forget to get the tickets. Tonight, tickets on sale. All these, all these is. 30, 40 years old, 50 years old, all this stuff we're looking at. Yeah, at least, yeah. Yeah. We can, uh, we can take it. Now, here's another lobby board, the voodoo show, Frankenstein murder committed before your eyes. Thrills, laughs, chills, in person on our stage. Go ahead. Now, some of the old skeletons he used to use hang out in front of the theater for Flash. You don't see this particular model around anymore, do you? They've all souped it up and made it a little bit different. Yeah. This is basically, uh, you look at the bottom of the stuff, this is the uh, 
steps to get away. This is it for the bus saw. This is the gimmick where you take the ground to four parts. Yeah. These are all bases. That's an Ireland sub trunk there. Uh, all these big magic illusions. Now, see, I'm getting a real close up just right of your face and shoulders only. And that's about the extent of it, you know? This, this is, I say, just some of the stuff that's. That's the head for the disembodied egg. Right, that's uh, the, the cabinet was all. Uh, yeah. And of course, I had a unique thing of always put my name in, in on every piece of equipment in somewhere. Yeah. And that uh, saved me many times uh, getting it. Uh, Getting it. Uh, uh huh. Uh, uh, the. Go ahead and start all over now. Uh, so we had one scene where the girl was uh, uh, hooked up to a cross in the back. And Igor would come out and cut the rope and miss, and her body would drop, and the arm would be hanging there, dripping blood. Then, uh -huh. uh, and uh, then, he, then Frankenstein would come out, choke Igor, and from about 20 foot away, I'd throw a butcher knife into his back. Uh -huh. And as he turned to get the back, the audience saw the blood running down. It was quite impressive. At that point, he staggered towards the step, and the griller came out the other side, and uh, it was. Uh, if they throw that on, in emergency, we still wouldn't be, uh, the, the aluminum skeletons would still be uh, illuminated. Uh-huh. This building is literally crammed and jammed to the rafters with memorabilia from magic and spook shows and other shows. Raymond's a collector. He never threw nothing away. He's got posters in here. He's got posters in here from all kinds of shows over the years. That date, that Orpheum Theater yeah, date, the yeah. big date you did yeah. out there in uh, Los Angeles, right? Yes. What year was that? I'd have to get my date books and check. Friday, it. October the 30th. They never put any years on these, isn't it strange? Well, it didn't mean anything. No, it yeah, mean. it makes sense to me, yeah. That's a nice card. That's a silk screen card and it's yeah. beautiful. Could you show me a couple of them other beautiful cards there? God, you had enough of them. There's Raymond's Midnight Voodoo Show, Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh-huh. And then you had the... Uh, Sherman Theater, Chillicothe, Ohio. Sunday night. There was not a city or town in the United States I don't think we'd play it at some time or other. Now there's the old Anaton in New York. Now, Victory Theater. And I wonder where that's at. She was there for a two-day stand, Friday and Saturday. Uh, oh, this is Baltimore. That's Baltimore.
Philip Morris of Charlotte, North Carolina, taking the time out of his busy schedule to let us film an interview at his Morris Costume Company in Charlotte. Phil was one of the big three in the spook show industry. He toured with Horrors in the Night, Dr. Evil and his Terrors of the Unknown, and he did spook shows throughout the United States and Canada from 1950 through 1977. Here's Phil. What a pleasant surprise. A magical surprise at that. It's been a long time since I saw you, Phil. Well, it's good seeing you, Jim. I haven't seen you since, well, since the old ghost show days. Yeah, it brings back a lot of memories walking around your store here. It sure does. Oh, what would you like to see around the store? Yeah, I would. I'd love it very much. Well, let me give you a little tour. Good. Come with me. We're going to take you all the way through and show you our wholesale department. And we literally ship uh, items all the way around the world. And here we're in uh, Jim Lawrence's office. Jim is our uh, sales manager and uh, designs a lot of our uh, masks that, uh, that you see in stores uh, all over the United States, uh, including the Batman uh, mask, Catwoman, Joker, and how about the uh, world's famous Ninja Turtles. Come on, I'll take you back to our showroom where in the, you'll see a collection of hundreds of different masks. On to our showroom. Here we go. Jim, here is a collection of uh, some of the greatest masks in the world. As a matter of fact, we sell more masks than any other company in the world. Masks of all kinds, but our number one featured mask would be the horror mask. The Dracula's, and Frankenstein's, Creatures from the Black Lagoon, and of course, Predator. Motion Picture Company, they're now calling us to, uh, to obtain some of the props that they use in the films, television uh, studios, the networks, and uh, as a matter of fact, let me uh, show you over here. Come on with me just a second, and I'll show you some of the... Uh, but I made it, well, I made it off of uh, a mold off of my, uh, my wife's ears. Yeah, those are the best ears of my life. My wife. Yeah, well, let's see. And uh, if you'd like... How about a, uh, a pizza? Ooh. You deliver, right? Door to door. And strange things from beyond the grave occupy our four walls here. Grandson, Sean Bain. He knows nothing about ghost shows because ghost shows were long gone from the theaters when the, when he was born. But uh, I told him about them, 
and I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, the ghost shows, how they started, and the history of ghost shows. Thank you, Sean Bay. Ghost shows were with us for a long time. Back around the turn of the century, the major touring illusion shows, Blackstone, Thurston, uh, would uh, play a theater for an entire week, and they would advertise that on Saturday night they were going to do a special midnight extra show. And that show would be a spiritual seance where they would try to contact the dead. Houdini was uh, uh, used this uh, publicity to obtain uh, uh, attendance in the theaters as well. He uh, uh, advertised the seances and then exposed the seances in showing how it was possible uh, for these fake mediums to, uh, to uh, contact the people from beyond the grave. Well, the theaters became the center of entertainment motion picture theaters became the center of entertainment uh, around the country. And starting back in the early 40s and late 30s, there were uh, ghost shows started to, to appear in the motion picture theaters, along with a film that was uh, uh, on the screen, of Frankenstein or Dracula film, and then, the, then about an hour stage show. And at the close of the stage show, they performed the seance. We called it the blackout. At that time, all the lights in the theater were turned out. And it was very important that every single light in the theater was out. That is, all the lobby lights, the concession lights, the uh, doors had to be closed going to the outside, the aisle lights, the lights in the projection room, any lights backstage. And that was one of the first things you did when you arrived at the theater to perform the show, to see how effectively you could get a blackout in the theater, uh, including they always had a, a clock uh, in the theater that was that lit. Uh, and you had to make sure that was turned up because that was on a separate line. And during the blackout, the audience would see strange and unusual things fly over their heads, back and forth, they hear strange sounds, things grab them in the dark. I'm going to show you how some of those things were done. Watch. Cut. Theater. During the entire performance, it was a build-up to the blackout, and telling the audience all the things they were going to see when all the lights went out in the theater. Also, the pre-advertising for the show had set in their minds some of the weird and strange things that they were going to see. When it arrived time for the blackout, the performer on the stage would call for all the lights to be turned out in the theater, except for the lights on the stage. And then he would prepare the audience for the blackout, having them reach out and hold on to the hands of the person sitting next to them. And that was for two reasons. It was a psychological reason, and it also prevented your audience from panicking during the times while the lights were out. And then the monsters would appear on the stage. Music would come up. We used from the projection booth, from the uh, uh, projectionist in, in the, uh, at the projector, would show a film of lightning on the screen against the curtain that was behind us to give the effect of lightning. And of course, the sound uh, in a motion picture theater was superb from all the other sounds that were available at that particular time in history. So we ran a loud, very loud uh, soundtrack over that. And as the monsters would come out on the stage and start down in the audience, then the lights on the stage would black out, and it was total darkness. At that point, you could not see your hand in front of the face, in front of your face. However, strange things started to appear around the theater such as skulls that were floating in the air, skeletons dancing on the stage that would come apart and then come back together, other things that would fly over your head. Well, let me give you an idea how this was done. Here's a skull. This was called a skull paddle. And this skull has luminous paint on it. We charged it with light before the blackout. And then, as part of the staff, during the time when the lights were out, we carry it out onto the stage, they're dressed in black, the other side of the skeleton is black, and then turn it around. It would appear and float across as if it was floating in the air, and then turn it around and it would disappear. We had other performers out in the audience who would actually go up the aisles in the theater carrying these things over their heads. We also had what we called a ghost banner, and that was a large flag with a ghost, a spider, or bat painted on it in a luminous. 
and that would fly over the top of the heads of the audience, and they would reach up to grab these things as they came out. And the people were screaming, yelling, and hollering. We also had uh, several people sitting in the balcony of the theater that had popcorn, the raw, on-pop kernels of popcorn. And we said in the audience's mind that when all the lights went out, that strange spiders would land on them and crawl over their bodies. Well, the person in the balcony would toss out the popcorn, spreading it out, and here these things are landing on you in the dark, and you have no idea what it is. That was a ghost show. Well, I'll tell you some more about it. In 1950, October of 1950, I was still in high school. I saw a show come through the plane our uh, local theater was the Butterfield Theater chain in Michigan. It was Jack Baker, the Dr. Zucchini Asylum of Horrors, with Frankenstein in person. And I decided that's what I wanted to do. The last ghost show I did was in 1977. We booked a series all the way across Canada for famous players in the Odeon Theater Circuit. Uh, two units of the show, and in the summertime, I started on the West Coast with a unit that I had uh, in uh, Prince Rupert, British Columbia, and worked all the way to Toronto. And then I had another unit that started just uh, east of Toronto and went all the way out to the Maritimes, uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. We played, during those two months, literally every city in Canada with a ghost show. And to my knowledge, that was the last tour of any Signature. major ghost show uh, in the United States. So my time expanded uh, 27 years in performing ghost shows, and I must say it was a very enjoyable time in my life. I was very financially successful with ghost shows, I literally played thousands and thousands of them, from the really little small communities uh, throughout the United States and Canada to the major theater circuits uh, such as Warner Brothers, Paramount, uh, United Artists, uh, and so forth. Uh, and it was really an enjoyable and fascinating time for us. The motion picture theaters changed their policy uh, starting around the uh, 60s, uh, and theater business began to drop off a little bit. So we no longer would playing just midnight shows, we would maybe play a midnight show on a Saturday night or a Friday night, a Friday night and a Saturday night. Uh, but the motion picture theaters uh, had a policy of changing the film and their theaters three times a week. They would play a Sunday-Monday film, play a Tuesday-Wednesday, uh, and then play a Thursday-Friday-Saturday. So uh, it was possible for them to cut off any day of, of those of the, of the picture change and just run one day of a film rather than two or rather than three. And we would go in and play the theater for an entire day, that is, with a matinee performance and a night show, and run a film or two feature films along with the show. The great advantage here is we reached a whole new crowd. We reached a family crowd. We reached the, the younger crowd. Uh, and business was very, very good. As I said, I probably made uh, as much or more money on a go show than anyone else who was ever in the business. Uh, and that's because we looked at it as a business, uh, as an artistic business, but we looked at it as a business. What happened to the ghost show business? Well, let me tell you. There were several changes. First of all, the theaters changed. The giant theaters that we would play with 2,000 seats in them, the Warner Brothers theaters and so forth, those theaters disappeared and became complexes where they had five or six theaters motion picture theaters under one roof, running five or six different films, with the seating capacity of maybe only 200 or 300 people in an auditorium. So it was impossible to, uh, to play these theaters with that limited capacity. You just could not get enough uh, attendance in there to make it worthwhile. That was number one. Number two, the theaters changed their booking policy. That is, rather than changing three films a week, they would uh, now, and as they're doing even today, would uh, book a film, and it would stay in a theater for a month, two months, six months. The film would stay there as long as the theater was doing business. So it was impossible to interrupt that theater for a one-day run for your film, and the day of the midnight show had disappeared. So that's what happened, really, to the motion picture theater ghost show as we know it. But the ghost shows are still there. And I've never really left the business. 
uh, Morris Costumes, uh, we produce more items for haunted houses and other types of, uh, of attractions throughout the United States and, through, and, then, and throughout the world than anyone else. Uh, my book on how to operate a successful haunted house has been uh, very, very um, widely used for, for people who are creating haunted houses. Also, the haunted house itself is the replacement of today's modern ghost show. Uh, when I, what I call the modern ghost show from the 50s. Uh, the haunted houses do a fantastic business. As a matter of fact, I know of four haunted houses in the United States that gross over a million dollars in a three to four week run during the month of October. And that's really doing something. When I first started playing motion picture theaters with a ghost show, our admission prices were 25 cents for children and 50 cents for adults. And I played the theaters for, for several years. I remember in the late 50s, someone telling me about uh, some theaters where they were getting a dollar for all seats uh, in New York and uh, Philadelphia and so forth. And I just could not imagine that. When I left the, uh, the uh, theater business, uh, the go show business in theaters, uh, we were getting two dollars uh, per person uh, for all seats and uh, that of course made a tremendous difference uh, in our grosses uh, but uh, and I thought that I would never see the day that that would happen and of course today if you were in a theater you could probably get uh, 10 15 dollars uh, admission to to see the shows the ghost shows in a theater today would have to change and that is Look at today's motion pictures. The monster and horror motion pictures of today are different than the monster or horror motion pictures of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. There was the creature of the Black Lagoon, the Frankenstein monster, and all those other characters that, uh, that have really become, well, part of our history in this country. But today's creatures are Freddy Krueger, they're creatures from that are part of the supernatural. And you would have to change in order to meet that crowd today. Um, but I can tell you that the technology that would be available for a ghost show, a horror show in the theater, today, you could do just miracles, miracles. I think often as I'm advertising gimmicks that we used in the uh, stage show was a uh, a free two-for-one pass. You could sit through the entire film, or through the entire stage show and the film. When you left the theater, if you were brave enough, we gave you a pass, a two-for-one pass, that could be used for a future motion picture. A uh, two-for-one pass is you know, two people come to the theater and one person gets in free. And that really helped the develop attendance. We also gave away bracelets, free bracelets, uh, charm bracelets, and identification bracelets to the uh, the girls if they were brave enough to set through the entire show. But the, the one thing that I developed that was uh, very successful for us was that we gave away a real dead body. We had a twist contest. Now a twist contest, you can, now we're really dating ourselves, but the twist contest and the winner would receive a real dead body. That's exactly what we gave them. We went through a large uh, ceremony in presenting the dead body to the person in a little small coffin and actually, it was a chicken, a dead chicken. And that is a real dead body. Jeez, I often think I want to get back in the ghost show business with, again, with all the things that are available today. Some of the funny things that happened to us with the show, uh, I recall being down in, uh, in Mississippi playing the theater. And, and after the show, there was an elderly gentleman standing by the back door watching us pack the show up. And every time I passed him, headed out to the, to the main uh, truck, I would say, uh, how are you? I said, fine. And uh, finally, we were through loading up, and I uh, was getting in the vehicle and ready to pull off. He says, uh, sir, he says, uh, can I uh, talk to you for just one moment? I said, well, how can I help you? And he says, well, he says, I've been a lot of places, and I've seen a lot of things. But when you come out on that stage and you push that walking stick to the lady, we had a little effect where we would have a cane that we'd walk up to one of the girls, press the cane in her back, and it seemed to go through her back and right out her, uh, right out her, on her, right out her stomach. 
He says, I know that you had something in your pocket, like a lodestone. Has you got anything that would help a gambling man? Well, I was taken back at first, and I thought, well, you know, here's a person who really believes in what he's saying, and I've got to help him out. I said, well, you wait right here. I said, those things are very valuable, and I, I don't keep them with me. So I walked around to the other side of the theater. It was dark, and I found a street light. I looked around for a stone that was just the right size, put it in my pocket, and walked back around the theater to where he was standing, and I gave him the stone, and I said, listen, this stone will bring you good luck for the rest of your life. Always carry it in your left hand pocket, and it works better when the moon's full. Now, if it seems to waver in its power, then what you do is soak it overnight in vinegar. Now, that was many years ago, and I can tell you that that man thanked me, bowed, and shook my hand, and wanted to know whatever he could do for me. And I know that when that man passed away, and they buried him in his coffin, that he probably still had that stone in his pocket. We were playing another theater up in, uh, well, this was in Canada, up in Nova Scotia. And um, they had a, a display in the lobby. We would we'd have them place a coffin in the lobby with a sign on it that says, uh, Quiet, please. Dr. Evil's asleep inside leave the coffin out there for several weeks before the uh, show. And uh, they had a cleanup man who would sweep up the theater, and the theater manager said that he noticed that after a week or so that, that everything was swept up clean in the theater except for a little room right around the coffin. That his cleanup man would only get so close to that coffin. So on the day of the show, they took the coffin upstairs and put it in one of the prop rooms. And uh, they had one of the ushers climb inside the coffin and lay down. They closed the lid. And they sent the cleanup man up to the room. Now, this is up on the second floor of the theater. Well, the cleanup man walks in to the room. And as he's in the room and turns on the light, the usher opens up the lid of the coffin and starts to set up. So that cleanup man ran to the window of the, of, the, of the theater and was starting to jump out the window. And he was yelling, Mary, I'm coming to join you. Mary, I'm coming to join you. So there have been a lot of very interesting things that have happened to us and good times and fun times as you look back to the years and years that we traveled throughout the United States with it. Oh, I want to tell you another uh, advertising was the mainstay uh, you know, with your uh, the main reason that he showed did, did, did business. I uh, early uh, in the game uh, caught on to the idea of using radio. Back then you could buy a radio spot for uh, a dollar, a minute radio spot for a dollar, and we would buy a hundred radio spots to run over a four-day period prior to the show, and a total saturation campaign. Of course back then there were maybe uh, only one or two radio stations in a community. So you absolutely saturated the community with your advertising. Window cards, uh, lobby cards for in the theater, trailers that uh, appeared on the motion picture screen that told about the show, uh, newspaper advertising, those things were all very important. We had a newspaper ad uh, in the classified sections of the ads that advertised uh, wanted girls uh, for the mad doctor to amputate the limbs of the lovely ladies on the stage or uh, lost or strayed a giant uh, monster, if seen, uh, called Dr. Morris or Dr. Evil uh, at the uh, Paramount Theater. Uh, things like that uh, that created the tension and the talk uh, in the community. I can tell you when the show arrived that it was unbelievable. Uh, the uh, uh, emotion that was already uh, uh, in the community, uh, it was very common to see lines of theaters uh, two and three blocks long. Uh, we would play motion picture theaters on a midnight show, for instance, and fill up one theater of 2,000 seats, and then the uh, theater company would open another theater across the street. We would open that one, and then maybe a third theater down the street and open that one. Uh, they would uh, show the film first in the first theater, and the films are on reels. Uh, 
on a, a reel runs about 18 minutes, or it did then. Uh, they would just bicycle the reels as soon as the first reel was over, they would go to the first, second theater, and then as soon as they showed it there, they would go to the, to the third theater, and they just keep the reels of the, of the film going. And by the time the film was over in the first theater, you put on the stage show there, uh, and then the people from theater number two would leave that theater and come over to theater number one to see the stage show. And you would have stage shows going on. I, I've had stage shows going on till 4, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. And that is really unbelievable, that, that a stage show of this caliber could outgross any other type of attraction that would appear in the theaters, including uh, big bands and, and, and big time motion picture stars that were making personal appearances at the time. This is a poster from one of the early shows. Uh, uh, we dare you to see the mad Dr. Morris in his dungeon of death. And presenting the monster Omar. We just uh, picked that name out. We thought it was a very unusual name and, uh, and created our own monster, rather than having uh, Frankenstein or, uh, or uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon or the Mummy or King Kong. Uh, as we used uh, uh, later on. Reminisce about those uh, marvelous days in the ghost show business that started me on to the road of success through life. And uh, thanks again for coming by. And the next time you're down this way, I hope it's not another 30 years or so since I've seen you, that you'll stop by and, and say hello. So long. Oh, wait a minute. There he is. My agent. Wondered what happened to him. Still hanging around. anything that you ever seen or heard of in the past. Hideous creatures from beyond the grave. Leave the stage and grab girls right out of their seats. Girls, do not come alone. Bring your boyfriend to protect you when the lights go out. You may find a live snake or rat under your seat. A real dead body is given away to some lucky person at every performance. Also, in person. The Mummy and King Kong, famous Hollywood gorilla, real and alive. Plus, on the screen, two horrific motion pictures. Dr. Evil and his tears of the unknown. Plus, two horrific pictures. <laughs> on stage, first time here, three all-new Super Shock shows, stage show number one, from beyond the grave, it's Dr. Evil and his tears of the unknown, unlike anything you have ever seen before, the theater is turned into a graveyard, your seats become coffins, weird creatures sit next to you and put their cold, clammy hands around your throat and whisper things in your ears. Live snakes roam up and down the aisles and human monsters run loose in the audience and cut off the heads of beautiful girls. It's weird and unbelievable. Plus, stage show number two. See in person the mummy and King Kong, famous Hollywood gorilla. Real and alive, 
We can't advertise what the mummy does when he grabs beautiful slave girls and the lights go out. But wow, something you never dreamt you'd see anywhere. Warning, girls should not come alone. You will have nightmares for a week. However, the theater management will stop the show anytime it becomes too scary. All on stage, in person, plus a horrific screen program. No documentary would be complete without, com without including Pat Patterson, Jr. of Gastonia, North Carolina. Now, I worked with Pat on some magic shows, and I worked with him on some spook shows. We worked on a Karakum show one time, and we're the ones that previewed Karakum's Cannibals of Caratiba. Pat went on to make quite a few movies. He did the special effects and the horror effects for quite a few movies. His most famous movie was Dr. Gore. Let's take a look at the Dr. Gore clip. presents for the first time on any stage anywhere you'll see blood-curdling space monster who died yet alive will come to seek the warm blood he needs to keep himself alive don't treat this lightly. How are you fixed grave enough? <laughs> I've toured with quite a few spook shows. I worked with Wayne Harris on the Dr. Jekyll and his weird show. I worked with Johnny Cates on Dr. Macabre's Frightmare of Movie Monster. We also did the first Monster from Outer Space show for Joe Carston. I toured with Pat Patterson on Kara Coombs show. Even was crazy enough back in the late 70s to take out a spook show called the Texas Chainsaw Monster Show. Of course, by the late 70s, it was all out and all over, and I died at Cohiba show. Let's look at that poster one more time. This was a real strong campaign, alive on stage, regurgitating horrors. Volunteer, we've thrown off the stage, one piece at a time. Kara Coombe of Hollywood presents Cannibals of Caratiba with King Lungry. Smell and feel your flesh sizzle and sputter when being burned alive. See and gasp as your stomach is sliced open and slew the intestines and other slimy guts ripped out and passed to the audience to be eaten. We, dare, we are daring to present real horror that will make you vomit. Now, needless to say, this was strong stuff and the public would not accept it at the time. And it died a quick death. Now what's ironic about the whole thing, uh, three or four years later, Herschel Lewis and Dave Friedman came out with Blood Feast on film and were highly successful. They broke the gore barrier. Karakoub tried it on stage, it wouldn't work. They did it on film and it was highly successful. 
As I said before, it's my personal opinion that Jack Baker was the king of the spook shows. I don't think anybody will argue with me with that. You know, Jack's no longer with us, but his brother Wyman is still out there doing the old ghost show. He's in his late 70s, and he's doing ghost shows. Of course, he's not playing in theaters. He's got a little gimmick the way he presents it and all to make a living. I'm not going to go into that. But he does do the old spook show. Now, I was lucky enough to round up a video of Wyman Baker actually presenting a spook show. Now, before we show it, I must tell you, it's got a little jitter in it. It cannot be helped. It's the only one I could find. But I think you're going to enjoy seeing Wyman Baker, the brother of the King of the Spook Shows, actually performing a midnight spook show. Here's Wyman.
about advertising see Marilyn Monroe mystically transformed see the earthy old materialization of Elvis Presley well here's how that worked Jack Baker was lucky enough to find a young man that looked just like James Dean James Dean had just passed away he was a famous cult hero he was hot so Baker had this young man walk out on the partly lit stage under the blue light. And the soundtrack played James Dean's voice, and it went over very well. Of course, all the other operators, they couldn't find a look-alike for Marilyn, or couldn't afford to carry a look-alike for Marilyn or Elvis, but they got smart. They had taken luminous paint, glow-in-the-dark paint, paint a portrait of Marilyn, a blow-up of her famous nude scene from Playboy number one. Her paint a blow-up of Elvis Presley. Now, during the end of the spook show, when the lights were out, this would mystically appear and float around on the stage. That's how most of the spook show operators presented that. There was a magician's trick called the spirit paintings that involved a box and you would hold up these frames, canvas frames with nothing on them, stick them in the box, turn the light on, and as the light come up from dim to bright, the pictures of the stars would appear. Now you could do this example at a drive-in theater where you couldn't turn out all the lights and make it dark to do it the other way. Let me tell you how that worked. In the top of that frame behind a piece of wood, was a window shade roller with a roller with a blind that had the picture painted on it. As you place that frame in to push it down, it caught on the edge and pulled that picture down behind your blank frame. Then when the lights come on, that showed through. That was an old magician's trick. That's one of the ways they did that. A gentleman named Mark Walker as did about 20 years of research on the old spook, ghost, and horror show days. He, it's really extensive. And he came out with this most beautiful book called Ghost Masters. I would suggest anyone that's interested in the further study of spook shows to obtain a copy of Ghost Masters from Mark Walker. It'll make a welcome addition to anyone's library. Towards the end of the old spook show era, most all the stages in the theaters were gone. They built the big cinemascope screens. They changed one big theater into four small ones, multiplexes. There was just no place left to do spook shows. But Joe Carston was not a man to give up. He went out and he got that gentleman to make the movie Monsters Crash the Pajama Party. You could do that in a theater with no stage. You could do it working out of the exits. But it had a flaw. It only lasted 35 minutes and it caused a lot of heat. So it was short-lived. But Joe was not one to give up. He got a hold of Dennis Ray Steckler and picked up on his movie, The Incredible Strange Creatures That Became Mixed Up Zombies. He changed that to Teenage Psycho Meets Bloody Mary. Now this was a pretty nice little movie filmed in color with fairly good production values. And Joe played this all over the country to a really successful business. So his Teenage Psycho Meets Bloody Mary was highly successful. Of course, when that played out, he wouldn't give up. So went back and got another one of Steckler's movies called The Thrill Killers and changed that to The Maniacs Are Loose. He also took Steckler's movie The Lemon Grove Kids and had an in-person show playing theaters for Kitty matinees. So scary. We dare you to see The Monsters Crash the Pajama Party, the first movie ever filmed in Hollywood's latest miracle, Fantastic Horror Vision. 
you'll be petrified as fiendish movie monsters actually become alive, then crash right out of the screen, run into the audience, and carry screaming girls from their seats right back into the picture to become part of the movie, never to be seen alive again. They might choose you. We warn you, this is not 3D. The movie monsters actually become real flesh and blood. See what happens when the pajama party girls meet the Mad Doctor's girl-crazed monsters. 1,001 exciting scenes on screen and right in the audience alive. All in the world's weirdest movie, the monsters crash the pajama paint in horror vision and color. We dare you to see the maniacs are loose. Loose, loose, loose. The world's first horror movie made in hallucinogenic hypnovision. Hallucinogenic horrors not only on the screen, but in the audience all around you. It's a hallucinogenic nightmare. You are put in the middle of the picture with bloodthirsty maniacs all around you. Not only on the screen, but live maniacs in the audience. All over the theater, looking for homicidal maniacs escape from an asylum. They terrorize a community. Gullible, love-starved women become their prey. And you'll see these same bloodthirsty maniacs in the audience all around you alive. For the thrill of your life, see, the maniacs are loose. Well, we just about come to the end of our journey down Spook Show Lane. I hope this documentary has given you some insight on just how the Spook Shows operated and what really went on back in the good old days. I mentioned earlier Mark Walker's book, Ghost Masters, which is highly recommended. However, the book does have one flaw. It's a goody-goody book. It portrays Spook Show operators to be saints and not sinners. This ain't necessarily so. The spook show business was full of gangsters, liars, thieves, anything for a fast buck. Of course there was a few guys around. They actually tried to give them a good show, give them a good performance, but most guys just really didn't give a damn. They was making that fast money while they could. That's the only thing I have against Mark Walker's book is it don't tell it like it really is when it comes to that part of the business. It's about time to end it all. You know, this project's been a labor of love. I've certainly enjoyed rounding up the interviews, rounding up the advertising. I've had a lot of fun. I've drove a lot of miles and spent a lot of gas. I'll probably lose money on the whole project. But it's been a lot of fun for me. It's brought back a lot of old memories. And I hope you enjoyed my spooks are popping. Right now I want to say so long and happy haunting.
did. It was just hit and run. Grab that money and run. It was a big hustle, yeah. Right. partner that they encountered got me fired at the job that I was working at and was in a stop with the experiment and work for a chasing up thing is, that's an actor's term now, we're getting into the, the mm -hmm. legitimate theater now. Oh, my God. Oh, 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 yeah. see, you see the books you're surrounded by here. Uh -huh. I'm an aficionado of all that good stuff. Now, yeah. anyhow, anyhow, Jim, what it is, you have to have a girl in the audience that is a stooge that wears a white blouse and a checkered skirt. This girl has to be a stooge. She has to wear has this to outfit. That. And Come you on. have to talk to her before the show. Mm -hmm. You cannot go out there and grab any girl. Well, don't do that. Yeah. Her she big brother might beat hell out of him. Or, her, or, or for whatever, mm -hmm. loosely passed off as her boyfriend or whatever like that. Believe me, yeah. I've seen a lot of boyfriends that were monsters. Enough of that. Now, the thing is, when the gorilla and mad doctor head through the, out of the picture, right into the camera, uh -huh. there's a short blackout, about a 20 second blackout. The theater goes black. The theater goes yes, black. Yes, sir. That's all cued in the film. Uh -huh. It's taped in the film, because uh -huh. you could never teach one of those projectionists to drop the dowser and kill the arc like, yeah. like we used to do on the old ghost show. Yes, sir. I've never met a projectionist in my life, they and I'm serious. They would hit it. World, I'm talking to you out there. I'm serious. I've never met a projectionist in my life that could hit that arc light and keep that, that dowser and kill that arc light for you three times. They could do it once on the ghost show.
years old. Yes. I got in on the tail end. Was pretty and she was great and she was sharp on that stage. Hats off to you, Marcy. Seriously. Talking about the old spook show and the old ghost show days. I cannot I believe, believe Jim. I can't believe I'm 54 years old. Yes. I got in on the tail end of the ghost show days. And nowadays there's no show business left. And there's no show business left and I feel like a dinosaur. That's the truth. Yes, I well, feel like a dinosaur. Uh, I'm making a living with videos now, but it's a goddamn shame because television and a VCR put show business out of business. There ain't none left. The guy gets off from work. He goes by the 7-Eleven, he gets a case of beer, two bottles of wine, three bags of chips, two chip dips, and he goes home and gets in a recliner like you are now, and you couldn't get him out with a double barrel shotgun. Now that's a hell of a way to live, isn't it? Yeah, and to think all the miles we've trooped in them. And you've had the pleasure of knowing and working with lots of interesting shows. John, today, let's talk about the old spooky ghost show day. Now, Jim, Yes, like 